Well, good morning. Many Americans are concerned about recent uprisings against President Trump and the recent shooting in the small church in Texas. During our show this morning, we will be talking about these topics. I'm Faye, and you're watching Live Talk with Faye. As most of you know, Live Talk with Faye is connected to our e-magazine. I want to say welcome to all of you, whether you're watching from the um, webinar, from YouTube, from um, our Facebook, wherever you're watching from, I just want to say welcome to you today. My guest today is my husband, Dr. Bill Hanshu. He's an apostle, an author who has pastored for many years. He loves to dig in and he's on the cutting edge of the word of God. He loves to share to all people around the world. He's producer of World Bible School, which includes Take Another Look, Kingdom Dynamics, and more. He's had some great, great guests on his Kingdom Dynamics show, and I'm sure people in the listening uh, area has been really blessed with those guests. Um, we're working on opening a World Bible School University right here in Rolla. And I will say right now to put a plug in for that, that tomorrow night, Tuesday, November the 7th, at from 5 to 8 p.m., we will be having a special webathon. And that will be to raise money to get the building for the World Bible School University. I'm just going to take one name and name one person that's going to be on the webinar webathon with us. And that's Cynthia Rothrock. She's a five-time world champion in forms and weapons. She took first place in forms 32 times, first place in weapons 12 times. She holds seven black belts in various Far Eastern martial arts disciplines. Um, in 1983, she was inducted to the Black Belt Magazine Hall of Fame as Female Competitor of the Year and was recently on the cover of the same magazine. And the article was entitled Legends of the Martial Arts, Cynthia Rothrock. And most importantly, Cynthia loves God. And one of her favorite sayings is, all things are possible with God. So when I asked her if she would be on our uh, webathon, um, she had no no questions. She was totally on board with it. She's been sharing it with other people. So I am just very, very excited to meet her online and talk to her. I've talked to her before on the phone, but um, I'm just very, very excited to have her to come on our webinar, web, webathon like like praise a thon it's it's a webathon because we're on our webinar webinar <laughs> okay but we will have other guests but i just wanted to share this one with you now so dr bill welcome to live talk with bay say hello to the viewers good morning everyone uh from wherever you are in the world we're glad you joined us today and uh share this link share this this uh video and let other people know that they need to get on here this morning. Many people have questions from the Bible, but either they're too afraid to ask or much like politics, they don't want to get involved in what the answers might be. But today we have some questions that have um, I've come up with and we've asked for questions. Uh, if you want to send them uh to my messenger. I will try to stay on top of that and look and see if you've sent any, any questions. Um, but we're going to get started now because I have a few and I want these, I want Dr. Bill to have time to give ample answers to these questions. So Dr. Bill, the first one I have for you is something that um, many people look at differently. They can say one thing is sin. One thing is not sin. This is sin, but that's not sin. What is the Bible's definition of sin? Well, Faye, that's an interesting question. The, the problem is, is the answer is not always what people want it to be. Because what people do is they think about sin and they start naming things because they know someone else has done that sin. But when we do that, we are setting ourselves up to judge. Now there is a godly judgment and the righteous are called to sit in judgment. The God, sons of God judge certain things, but we don't, when we're talking about judging, 
versus condemnation. We don't condemn people. And that's something that we don't know how to differentiate between sometimes. But if you look at the Hebrew definition all the way back to the book of Genesis, it literally means to miss or to go wrong. And uh, that's a very important uh, answer because when you get over into the New Testament, uh, into the Strong's, um, and I'm looking at Bible at the uh, uh, blueletterbible.com, uh, the the uh, Strong's definition just says that sin means a sin or an offense. But the Bible usage of this word is very similar to the Old Testament word, and it means to miss the mark. Other places, the word sin means an in, unintentional error or a deliberate transgression. So what we do is we say, OK, if sin means to miss the mark and people do miss the mark, we don't trade it as missing the mark. Like we would tell one of our children, it's OK, you just made a mistake. We could say that to anybody in the world. It's OK, you just made a mistake. But what people want to do is they want to take the definition and say, OK, you missed the mark. but there's an unintentional error. So if you didn't intend to do it, it just was almost happened accidentally. We'll let that go. But if it's an intentional error, now we're going to really highlight on that because you, you deliberately meant to mess up. Here's the thing. If God can forgive sin in his son, what's our problem? It doesn't matter if it's an unintentional error or a deliberate transgression. If God forgave sin and he doesn't hold any sin or transgression against us, we need to think about that. So if you're a Christian today or you're a, a non-Christian, you're watching this show today. The truth is, what does it matter if you know someone or even yourself, if you didn't mean to mess up or you deliberately messed up? Sin is sin. God forgave sin. I believe in repentance. I just don't believe it in the same way that a lot of people do. But the reality is, is it's missing the mark. And the mark, the A, there's only one mark. And that mark is the Lord Jesus Christ. OK, um, why don't you just uh, comment on um, Hebrews 10, 26 here where it says, let's see, I'll just read the, the New Living Translation. It says, dear friends, if we deliberately continue sinning after we have received knowledge of the truth, there is no longer any sacrifice that will cover these sins. What, what does that mean? Give me that scripture again. Hebrews 10, 26. Okay. So here's the thing. How we read that is really important. Okay. Um, so as you read it there, I'll, I'll go ahead and reread it from the New King James. For if we willfully sin, if, if we sin willfully after we have received the knowledge of the truth. So we take that first part and that means, okay, I have been told do not commit adultery. So if I willfully commit adultery after I have been received the knowledge of that, he says, therefore, there no longer remains a sacrifice for sin. Why is there no longer a sacrifice for sin? Can't I get forgiveness? Is there nothing that I can do to make that right now? Faye, as you know, if I was to go out and commit adultery with some other woman, you know, not only would I be in trouble with you, uh, it would really potentially ruin our marriage. But let, let's lay that aside for a moment and just go back to the question, because the truth is, even if I've received the knowledge about sinning and I choose to go ahead and sin, there's no more sacrifice that can be paid because the sacrifice has already been done. And that's what that means. So what Christians do is they read that, but they read it together instead of looking at what is it actually saying? So uh, it's like um, uh, Romans, uh, Paul said in Romans, uh, can Jesus who has ascended, uh, has can he descend into the depths of the earth? Can he ascend? Can he pay the sacrifice over again? No, he can't. He won't. It's done. Sin has been forgiven. And so, you know, I, you know me, Faye, for many years I have said, here's the thing about forgiveness and repentance is forgiveness was released in Christ at the cross. And what we need to do is just receive his forgiveness, just embrace his forgiveness because his forgiveness has a motivation behind it, which is to love us, to love us out of our mess. Right.
right? That's very good. Um, the second one, uh, a lot of people has a problem with this. A lot of people think that if we have a Christmas tree that we're wrong. If we, well, let me take some from, from the law. And the, the question is, what is God's law? And maybe I should go according to my notes in um, Genesis 26, 4 and 5. It says, I will make your seed to multiply as the stars of heaven because that Abraham obeyed my voice, kept my charge, my commandments, my statutes, and my laws. We believe the Ten Commandments, along with the other 613, were nailed to the cross. Um, and Jesus gave us two new commandments. But I was, I was studying on this, and I read where one person says that he believes the word uh, ordinances from Colossians 2.14, which says, blotting out the handwriting of ordinances that was against us, which was contrary to us, and it took out of the way, nailing it to the cross. He believes the word ordinances, which comes from the Greek word D-O-G-M-A, dogma, which means a law, civil or ceremonial, public decrees, the laws and the requirements of the laws of Moses. He believes that it was the ordinances of men, not God's law, which Psalms 19 describes as perfect, sure, right, and pure, along with the death penalty we earn through the sin that were nailed to the cross. Um, so, so what is God's law? What can we look and see that is God's law that is perfect, right, pure? Well, first of all, um, this person, I don't want to be contrary to someone, but when you look at the Strong's definition of that word, which is dogma, um, and, and I'll give you the Greek enunciation here, uh, and that was pronounced correctly. Um, it, it means it means some things and you have to look at how the Strong's whoever wrote the James Strong's would put this together. It first it means a law, but in parentheses, it prefaces what the law means. It's civil law. It's ceremonial law. It's ecclesiastical law. Now, it also can mean a decree or an ordinance. Here's the problem with that is God's law covered civil law, ceremonial law, ecclesiastical law. Uh, this was this could mean man's law, but it's not talking about that. Uh, even one of the biblical usages of the word refers to the rules and requirements of the law of Moses. So we're actually not talking about man's law. And why how we get that idea, Faye, is because it mentions civil law. And people don't think that God has any civil laws. But all the way back in the Old Testament, all of the law of God was good. We need to understand that. But what happened was, is the law could never make us holy. And people would try to keep the law and they would fail at keeping the law. And even, and someone told me one time, there was one or two people, the Old Testament says, actually kept all the law. But here's the thing. It would have to be, which all the law did they keep? Because there was more than one segment of the law. Now, to, to answer your question, uh, what is the law of God? what the law of God was in the Old Testament, because you you posted here uh, Genesis 26, 4 and 5, talking about that God said to Abraham, I'll make your seed, uh, uh, I will make your seed to multiply as the stars are of the heaven, because uh, because Abraham obeyed the, his voice and kept his, his charge, his commandments, his statutes, his laws. But you see, Faye, you and I were not born under the Old Testament law. And so we are not Old Testament people. We're not. And I, I, I see two, there's two things I see posted more than anything. And one of those, I'll just mention one because I think we're going to get into the other. One of those is the Ten Commandments. Now, I'm not for breaking the Ten Commandments. I think the Ten Commandments is a good thing in terms of that. You know, and you're right, Faye. Uh, there are 613 laws in total. But do you know that the, the laws that were written on stone were not only the Ten Commandments. There were the priests would, as people would go into the, the village, the priests, every morning, they would write the law on huge rocks, slabs of stone, and people would have to recite the law. 
every day. And you know that a Jewish child, by the time they were five years old, knew the Torah and memorized the Torah. That's what that was a requirement. But do you know, remember, memorizing something and keeping something is not the same thing. So Jesus said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to simplify this because we've got 613 laws and people just can't keep all those laws, let alone uh, 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 practice them day by day. So Jesus said, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to give you two new commandments. And I want you to hear this, uh, everybody that's watching today. Jesus was not trying to, to do away with the old law. He came to make it better. He came to make it doable because there was something missing in the law. There was something that needed to be fulfilled for us to be able to uh, keep the law. And it's not about setting up in your front yard. We see this all the time. People will set up in their front yard the a display of the Ten Commandments. But, you know, we were in a uh, seminar recently and the Ten Commandments weren't just ten things written on the front of a stone. They're written on both sides. Now, uh, that says a lot to me about what God does. God doesn't just give us part of his word and then hide the rest of it from us. But here's the deal. Jesus said, I'm going to give you two new commandments. Love God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength. And he said, the second one's like it. Love your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus made this astounding statement. He said, on these two hang or, or this is the pivotal point, all the law and the prophets. So Jesus wasn't say don't listen to the prophets because the prophets, anytime you read in the Old Testament, Faye, and it's a type and shadow of something else and it points to the new, you need to understand this. Don't live the Old Testament and say, I'm going to keep these Ten Commandments or I'm going to keep these whatever. Just focus on two things. Love God with everything that you have, everything that you can have, which loving God with all your heart, mind, soul and strength only happens because of Jesus. Jesus empowers you to be able to do that. And here's the other astounding fact. To love your neighbor as yourself, that's a really deep issue. But you can only do that because Jesus is in your life. And the Bible said he didn't come to destroy the law and prophets, but he came to fulfill them. That Greek word there actually means he became the missing part. So you can now keep everything that God says to keep only because of Jesus Christ. And that's grace. Right, right. And I wanted to go over a little bit of this because I, I am fascinated with the 613 laws of why people think that we should continue to live under the law. Now, there's a lot of good ones. They're broke into categories. The first 10 laws are under God. And it says to know that God exists, not to entertain the idea that there is any God, but the eternal, not to blaspheme. Um, not to profane God's name, you know, to love God, to fear him reverently. I mean, there's things like this and they're, they're all very, very good. And then it goes on to the Torah, signs and symbols, prayers and blessings. There's many under each one of these headings, but I'm going to go down here to one of them that I was looking at number 172 under business practices. And it says, not to borrow on interest. Now, how many people today do you think could buy a house or even buy a car, which costs a lot less than a house most of the mm -hmm. time? How, how could they do that without borrowing on interest? There's no possible way if they don't have the money already saved up, which, you know, that is a good thing to do, to have your money saved up. But something as big as a home, the majority of the people can't do that. So if they broke this one law and they borrowed money on interest, they would be guilty of breaking all 613. And that's just number 172 in the law. Uh, Faye, I heard a very famous minister say uh, several times uh, that to borrow money is not a sin, but it is a curse. Now, mm -hmm. As I and even though this person is a grace preacher and a, a very, as I said, famous preacher today, I'm not going to say who it is, but I, I will say this. As I think about that, Faye, is it really a curse for a person or a couple to do everything they can to survive just to do their best, even if they borrow money? Where the curse comes in is it's I don't think it's the interest per se, because if you borrow money, it's reasonable that you should pay a certain degree of interest so that person can get their money back plus 
what it took them to give you the money that they didn't have. I, I don't have no issue with that. But where it becomes a problem is, is if you have a debt that you can pay in 10 years, but you borrow money, now it takes you 30 years to pay it back, then that's where it could kind of be a curse or a weight, a, a problem for you. So I kind of, uh, anymore, I kind of see that differently. Um, there's one on here, Dr. Bill. I guess you would be okay with this law. It's number 345 that you're not to remove the entire beard. Now you can't hardly see yours, but you've got a little bitty beard there. So I guess you're okay as long as you don't remove the whole thing. But all these guys out there that choose not to wear a beard, they would be in violation of, of law 300 and uh, whatever it was, 300 and something in there. And so if they were guilty of breaking that one, if they cut their beard off, then they were guilty of breaking all 613 laws. Here's the thing. There was a day that my beard was black or brown and you could see it <laughs> and now it's gray. And so you can't see it that much. Sometimes it just looks like a dirty face. But <laughs> the reality is, is we have nothing in our Christian society in the new covenant that says you can wear a beard, not wear a beard, wear part of a beard, wear a goatee, a mustache, none of that. So yeah, definitely. And you know, some of those things you read, they do remind me of a, just a different way to say the 10 commandments. These all seem to be a product of that. Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, we're going to go on and get off the law. Maybe one day I'll do something and we will just talk about several things in this law because I really don't believe people totally understand some of the things. There are things in the law that if you kept them today, you would be in violation of our laws, our land laws. And so, you know, there's, um, that's that's another story. We'll go there some other time. OK, question number three. Are we saved by just grace or are works involved? Yeah, that's a great question. Uh, my answer, uh, as I've been able to contemplate these questions, my answer is possibly not what some people would like it to be. But that's OK. I've not been known to really answer things based on how the people feel about them. So here's the predominant scripture I feel about grace. It's just one of many. For by Ephesians 2, 8, 9, and 10. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Now, there are a few ways to read this verse. One, what is it that that not that it's not of of uh, yourselves, but it's the gift of God. It looks to me that we could say the vehicle for getting saved or being rescued and rescued is a really good word to put there or delivered or whatever. Um, we could say that faith is not of ourselves. It's the gift of God, but we could also say that grace, which is the Greek word charis, which right. means um, a gift, that that gift is not of ourselves it's the gift of god but here's to answer your question verse 9 is crystal clear not of works lest anyone should boast now i, I want to say something today because my knowledge of god's gift continually changes because uh my knowledge continually uh changes because i study and and, and so on you know Faye, i really am concerned that we're trying to get something done in society that Jesus already did. For example, John 3, 16 says, for God so loved the world, and I like to interject the whole world, that he gave his only son, that the, that, um, uh, uh, for God's, go ahead. Whosoever believeth on him. Whoever believes in him would not perish, but have everlasting life. For God did not send his son to the world, verse 17, to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. So what we see there is, is if the world through him might be saved, we preface might and we use it incorrectly because we say it might happen, but might is not the way that word is translated there. So that the world through him might be saved. In other words, what we're doing is we're saying, okay, the work Jesus did, 
Now let's look at the work I can do so or anybody else can do so that I can participate in the work Jesus did. But what we're doing is we're canceling out the fact that Jesus didn't come to condemn the world. He came that the world might be saved through him, that the world would be saved. So Jesus did something that's far more powerful than what my saying, oh yes, I'll run to an altar and I'll pray the sinner's prayer. Jesus did something far more powerful because now we have to look at Paul's writings, who Paul is the only of the disciples, the only one. Paul was not a disciple of Jesus in terms that he was uh, with Jesus when Jesus was in his earthly ministry. Paul met Jesus in a, it was caught up in a vision or caught up in this, this great light that shone from heaven on the road to uh, Damascus. And Paul had a personal encounter with Jesus. He spent time with him in a way that I think no one else did. But here's what Paul says about it, that God was in Christ reconciling the whole world. It says world, but the whole world to himself. And and uh, I just really am fascinated with that verse. And I have a whole teaching on, on reconciliation. Uh, but the, the bottom line, Faye, is, is Jesus did something that's far more permanent and far more real than we could ever do. And I'm not against evangelism. I'm not against telling people they need to receive Jesus as their savior. But I just know that that's a now thing. And when it's all said and done, God has a plan for all creation. And I believe his plan is going to come about. I don't understand the plan. I don't talk about the whole essence of the plan because I don't get it all yet. But the truth is. Jesus did something that was for all creation, for all humanity. It's just that all humanity doesn't accept what Jesus did. You know, um, the disciples and all of those who wrote the Bible had a, a fascinating way. Uh, since I have a, 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 a company that produces books, mm -hmm. I might have went back to some of those disciples and said, now, wait a minute. For instance, like the Lord's Prayer, Our Father, which art in heaven. It's kind of like he broke those into titles, but in the book, he just put them all together, lumped them all together. But um, if you if you look at that, Our Father, which art in heaven. I mean, Our Father, Jehovah, Our Father, Rapha. You know, I mean, the different names. You can look at all the different names and and find out that he's our healer. He's our righteousness he's our peace he's he's our protection he's everything to us so just to say our father mm -hmm. doesn't give us a clear picture of who he really is mm -hmm. so you know i mean the the book was wrote by man that's why we think it is so important to go back to the greek and the hebrew and find out exactly what these words that were translated into english really mm -hmm. mean Okay, does the scripture actually say, now this is one that a lot of people may want to know, but may be afraid to ask. Does the scripture actually say people will go to heaven when they die? <clears throat> if you know of a scripture that says that, then what about John 3, 13, which says, and no man has ascended up to heaven. Some might say Jesus was confused if they believe in a literal heaven when they read this scripture. But we know we know for a fact Jesus wasn't confused and he he didn't um, overlay his words and say one thing and then say something else. So what do you say about that? Does the scripture say people will actually go to heaven? Jesus uh, proceeds in verse 12 by saying, if if I have told you earthly things and you do not believe, then how will you believe if I tell you heavenly things? He didn't say, if I tell you of heaven, he said, if I tell you heavenly things. And so he says, no one has ascended. Uh, this word ascend is a very interesting word. And you just heard me preach on this yesterday. And for those listening on my timeline, I have posted a uh, uh, an hour and two minute sermon on heaven and hell. And I go through the entire the, the Hebrew uh, meanings of the Old Testament for both words and the Greek meanings in the Old, New Testament for both words. And so to to ascend, when you study the word ascend, you often find that it has more than one meaning. 
it does it's not talking about going up in the sky because even when we look at the word sky or we look at the word air or we look at the word clouds we often find the same word as heaven and it doesn't mean to go to a far and distant place but the word ascend can mean to us ascend to a, a another a higher level of thinking and so when jesus said no one has ascended to heaven uh, this was prior to the cross no one was able to ascend to the mind of christ or to his way of thinking until after he had uh, died and was resurrected and he says no one can ascend to heaven but he who came down from heaven that is the son of man who is in heaven and so, and then he talks about as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man was lifted up. Uh, when Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, it was on a staff, but it was a wooden staff, and it was symbolic of the cross. And the serpent was not talking about the devil. That's another subject, okay? So we really don't want to go there because I'd have to do a little bit of research there. But our, to answer your question, Faye, uh, you know, some might say Jesus was confused if they believe in, in, a, in a, literal, a literal heaven. Um, you know, here's the problem, Faye. This is the Greek word for heaven is oranos, and it means the abode of God. And what people have a problem with, if I could challenge people, go to John chapter 14 and read it over again. But instead of think that because God has a, uh, that in my father's house are many mansions, the many mansions, mansions as dwelling places in the Greek, and you're one of those many mansions. And and he says, if I told you so, if I if I go away, I'll come again. It, just like I told you, he went. He was talking about going to the cross. He was not talking about going to heaven. And and you know, just because he was a carpenter's son, why do we think that he went to heaven so he can build a bunch of mansions so we can live in them someday? I mean, do you really think? That if we exit our, if let's go with the tradition, okay? If we exit our physical bodies as a spirit being, we're gonna need a house to live in. I mean, seriously, we're gonna need something to live in. But they, but it's so so that just proves them that it's not talking about that. So Faye, we need to ascend to a new level of thinking, and we need to understand that the new level of thinking is that Christ made His home in you and you are his dwelling place. Amen. Um, and, you know, I like to think also that, you know, well, when people die, um, our spirit came from God before we were born. It was with God and it came from God. It lives in us. And when we die, if we choose to die and not live forever, I want to beat Methuselah's age. I want to be the oldest that there was. And I want to just keep on living. But if people die, you know, they, they get very upset about this fact of not having a place to go. Now, personally, I can't see Jesus up in the sky somewhere taking a hammer and using wood and building a little mansion in the cottage or a cottage in the corner of heaven for some people. Because that's some some people say that's all they want is just a little cottage in the corner of heaven. You know, other people want a mansion. So then he's going to have to take a brick or semen and make that mansion. He's going to have to have all of these things up there and he's going to have to make that. How could he ever have time? to be here with us and to love on us if he's up there doing all that work. You know, I like to take, I like to consider the fact that heaven is just another realm. I heard a testimony and I wanted to share this because it means so much when you think about this. Um, one of the people that I saw in the beauty shop, actually the lady that cut my hair, um, her husband in August was in a very severe uh, wreck. He was driving a pickup. The one behind him was a small white car. The one behind the car was the cause of the accident. It was an 18 wheeler and he was either on his phone or texting and he ran over the white car, killing the person in that. And then he hit the, the pickup, the, the lady's husband and that pickup turned upside down and landed on the guardrail. Well, the gentleman has had, you know, three or four surgeries since that time because of this accident, but something happened 
during that accident. And this man uh, was in the pickup truck with him and he got wretch over and he held his hand, his head up and he said, don't move. He said, I was in the military and I have training for this. And he said, just lay still until they get here to take care of you. Well, when the people got there, they had to uh, cut out the door or whatever to get him out of there. And he said, we're going to take, they told him, we're going to take you in and, you know, and gave him all the comforting mm -hmm. words and everything. And, and he says, now wait, he said, you've got to get that other man that was in my truck out first. And he said, what other man? He said, there was a man in there that said he was from the military and he'd done this and that. And he was holding my head up so that it wouldn't move. And he said, sir, you have been unconscious for 30 minutes. There was nobody in the truck with you. Mm -hmm. Now, to me, that tells me this man was in the military. He told him nobody like that would lie. He was in the military and he had training on this. Just possibly that great cloud of witnesses that the Bible talks about, the ones that have already gone on over, mm -hmm. could be the ones that come through that, you know, realm into our realm and they help us when we need it. So if we're in that other realm, you know, who says that just because they see us because they come and help us? But who says we can't see them? You know, that's what I think about when I think about the sons of God, you know, becoming the people that God wants us to be. We can interact with that other realm. What do you think about that? Am I just off balance or is that a crazy thought or what do you well, think about that? Well, you've said a whole lot. Okay. And, <laughs> and you've, you've brought up many questions. Let me just try to address one. And then if you want to go back and, and have uh, make another point for me to address that's fine. Uh, here's why some of us believe that the idea of a rapture is escape theology is because there, there are, there are th uh, three basic reasons why people want to leave this world and believe in a rapture, believe in a heaven that they're going to go somewhere else. Uh, number one, because they get too old. Number two, because they're too sick. Number three, because they're too broke. They don't have enough money. Now, so my question would be, if you could find a way that getting older does not affect your life, and if you could find a way to be healed and not sick, and number three, if you could find a way to have all your needs met, uh, because not being broke doesn't mean having thousands or even millions in the bank, but if you could find a way to have your needs met and not be broke, uh, would you consider not having to die and go someplace else. I mean, those really are the reasons why people don't want to stay here. So here's my answer is if you can't believe your way, if you won't believe your way out of the Bible says that your youth should be renewed like the eagles. The Bible teaches us that our bodies are being transformed, that they're going from corruptible to incorruptible, from mortal to immortal. Uh, and if you can't believe that Jesus healed you, See, everybody wants to get healed, but nobody wants to believe they are healed. And everybody wants to get prosperous, but they don't believe they are prosperous. And so if you can't embrace those things, then here's the deal. You are going to die and you are going to end up in that great cloud of witnesses. But I've got news for you. Just because you've read First Thessalonians chapter 4 and you believe that one day we're all going to meet the Lord in the air and think that air means up yonder, uh, you made a mistake. Uh, the Bible said the dead in Christ will, will rise first, or we could say resurrect first. Where are they going to resurrect? They're going to resurrect just so they can go to a heaven. They're, they are in heaven. And then it said, and we who are alive and remain will be caught up together with them. I've studied those words in the Greek language. and I haven't looked at it for a while. But the reality is, is they're going to reappear with us. That's what that means. So there is going to be a day where there's going to be a rejoining uh, of our loved ones. And everybody will be these transformed, resurrected beings, just like Jesus was after his death. So there is a great cloud of witnesses. And as far as if you were specifically asking me what I think about the great cloud of witnesses, uh, the reality is this. Do I know that we can talk to them or that they can assist us or help us in life? My answer is I do not know that. 
Uh, I just know that they're there. I know that we also, Faye, even though we're clouded by this, this uh, we're clouded by this realm of the flesh, hindered by it. I know that we are also a part of that realm because it is a realm. It's not a planet someplace. Well, you speak of planet. Look at the universe. We can only think of Earth and maybe um, the sun and the moon, Pluto, uh, Saturn, the different ones that surround Earth is what we think of. But there is more than just our galaxies. There mm -hmm. is galaxies out mm -hmm. there. We don't know what's out there. Why would God pick over on 14th Street or the hole in the north uh, that scientists have seen a hole up there in the north? Why would he pick that place to make a heaven when there's all of these galaxies out in other places? You know, I mean, I know I've told this before, but I had a dream before Mr. Trump was um, voted in for uh, president. Hold on. I have someone trying to call in during my show and I've specifically mm -hmm. let them know that my show started. But anyway, um, oh, Facebook went down. I'm sorry. Well, I'll just have to post the, the webinar later. Um, but, but in my dream, I dreamed that Hillary Clinton was with me and she was in a spot where a building was going to come down and fall on her. And I got her out of the way and protected her. And in my dream, the important thing about it was there was these people in my dream that I knew were dead. They had already died and they were there and they assisted us on where to go, that that is important, where to go to get out of danger. And I led her out of danger. Now, she, I started to touch her on the shoulder once and she kind of jerked back and I said, I said, look, just because I disagree with you, and I did not vote for her, but just because I disagree with you does not mean that we don't mm -hmm. love you. You know, we are here to help every single person that means those people that are are the worst of the worst not just the best of the best but the worst of the worst we are here to help those people and to try sure. to to protect them try to try to help them so they don't have to live in hell on earth and that's what we're here for now now Faye, uh you know here's the problem if you try to interpret the bible let me get my Bible here. If you try to interpret this book simply based on the language you speak, your nationality, unless you're a, a, uh, a person who speaks perfect Hebrew and understands Hebrew and speaks perfect Greek. Do you realize that a lot of people speak English and say words, but they don't know what those words mean? Now, if that's a possibility, then why is it inconceivable that if someone speaks Hebrew or Greek, they may not know what those words mean? So here's here's my answer to heaven. I hope people are ready for this because the Bible said in Genesis chapter one and verse one, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Earth singular, heavens plural. Do you know what the Hebrew word heavens means? It's an uh, comes from an unused word. The origin of this word comes from an unused word, and it means heaven or it means sky. Now, the Greek definition of the word heavens, not heaven, but of heavens, comes from Jesus in Matthew 15, and it means the visible heavens, the atmosphere, the sky, the starry heavens. It can relate to a a spiritual heavens. But that's a different view of it. Now, the reality is, is when we say God created the heavens and you look up in the sky, and you see the beautiful clouds, you see the sun shining. You should say that's the heavens. But what happens is, is religion has interpreted heaven as being a faraway place. And, you know, when we talk about the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God. We talk about the old heaven and earth where I passed away and there's a new heaven and new earth. All of that is, is able to be explained totally based on 
the Hebrew and the Greek language, and based on uh, there's a proper interpretation, there's also goofiness. And well, Dr. Bell, if the heaven, which means you, you've quoted it from the Greek, means the atmosphere, the starry skies, that area. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. that's where the heavens are, why couldn't we see Jesus up there working, building those mansions if that's what he was doing? Yeah, we for sure. We see the skies, the you know the stars. We can see those. Let me were ask there... one final question before we okay. go on. Okay. Uh, when you were a first first young girl as a Christian, do you feel like your life has changed over the, these years, and that you feel like you've become a more knowledgeable and a better person? I'm talking about just as a Christian. I was saved when I was six years old, mm -hmm. and when I was a young person our pastor would give us um bible scriptures to find and go home and read and um it was very traditional but he got us involved in the bible which made me excited to find things i don't mm -hmm. like sitting down and reading the bible i would rather study subject by subject because in my opinion you can get more out just reading it you can go from one subject to the next depending on how, how much you just read. But when you study it, you can get a lot out of that, that thing. So yes, definitely from the time I was six years old until now, I believe I've grown a lot and I've changed my view on a lot of things simply because of revelation that comes. My reason for asking the question is the, is this answer. Has he not been building his home in you? Amen. That's true. Amen. All right. Okay. <clears throat> Next question. What does it mean when it says the church Christ built? Matthew 16, Jesus stated, I will build my church and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. What does that mean? Well, that's an interesting question because if Jesus is building a church, uh, he says that the gates of hell would not prevail against the church that he builds. So there are a lot of religions, but he's not talking about religions here. He's talking about people. And so uh, I just feel this way that the church that Christ built is not the same church that we try to build sometimes in terms of our, our beliefs. We really do need to change what we believe. You know, just like our uh, in the beginning of the show, Faye, talking about um, uh, the the ideas of, uh, of what was the question? Um, well, you asked me about um, uh, the definition of sin, and we talked about grace, and we talked about the things that you know Jesus actually did, and the reasons he did them. We need to change the way we think, or the way past religions have pre dictated to us about scripture uh, and start thinking the way he thinks because the Bible says that we have the mind of Christ. It also says in one other place that we're to put on the mind of Christ or let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ. And so you have to allow the word let also could be replaced by the word allow. You have to allow the mind of Christ that's been put in you to overtake you. And that means so that you begin thinking the same way Jesus thinks. And as a teacher of the Bible, uh, I'm a student of theology. I, I just believe that our theology is always wrong if our theology doesn't measure up to the of um, of of the love of God. Whatever God thinks about people, that's the measuring rod. Right, that's good. Um, you froze there a little bit, so if yeah, you, we both did. Yeah, if you would say that sentence over again, that um, yeah, about our theology. If our theology doesn't measure up to the measuring rod and that measuring rod is the love of God and how God feels about us, then our theology is wrong. So, you know, uh, theology, there's, there's an interesting word and I won't try to define it right now, but, but the first word is theos and that's, that's, uh, uh, uh God. Right. And so our theology needs to be Godology. Godology based on God. Amen. Um, the next question is, 
some of the next questions has to do with more of a personal question between someone and God. For instance, um, number A, what what does someone do when they have symptoms of sickness coming on them to stop this immediately? Or well, I'm going to tie B in with it and then we'll go to C later. But right. B, what if they're in a wreck? Did God take his hand of protection off of them when they had that wreck and then come back to them later? Or talk about that. I've known people who have given you something who would it, it get upset and take it back. Uh, here's what I think about that. God never takes back anything he gives. Um, you know, when the apostle Paul talked about uh, be, that you could fall from grace, when when I studied those words and what that means is that it can be as, as a momentary lapse in time. In other words, you could goof up and you just all of a sudden you'll realize, you know what? God never left me. He's not mad at me. I just had a momentary mess up. So, what happens when symptoms of sickness come? Uh, uh, how do we deal with that? If you think for one moment, and I'm speaking to our viewers now, and I realize the Facebook has gone off, but if you think for one moment that when something hurts, I don't say ouch, or Faye doesn't say ouch, you're wrong. But what you say based on your unrenewed mind and your, your physical body is one thing. Uh, there was We were talking earlier, Here's 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 how you got to view yourself as a spirit being. Do you know that God talks to us? If hey, you said that our spirit uh, will return to God, uh, Ecclesiastes twelve seven says for the the the, uh, the that the body that from dust we came to dust will return. That's talking about the physical man, uh, because even uh, as your body is decaying, also your body is being renewed with that resurrected supernatural body that, uh, that we're supposed to have. But, but it says also that your spirit will return to God who gave it. You are a spirit being. God speaks to you in your spirit, man, because uh, you are that spirit, man. You do not have a spirit. You are a spirit. But you have a consciousness, a, a natural awareness, and that's your soul. And you have a body. So what do you believe in your renewed mind? Do you believe you're the sick, not trying to get healed? Or do you believe you're the sick that uh, is healed because God said so? So what you believe is what will rule you. Uh, if you're in a wreck, does God take his hand off of you? Absolutely not. Even if you're in a car wreck, listen to me. Faye, if someone came in and chopped my head off and they thought they were doing that because of, of, of some uh, Eastern religion or, or some purpose, it would not affect me at all. Now, what people say by that is that, well, but of course it would affect you. You did. They chopped your head off. Now, I'm talking about me as a spirit man. It would not affect me one at all. I would be in the same place I am, but my eyes would be open. I that whole cloud of witnesses. I would see them instantly, uh, even though I know I'm interacting with them now. But uh, so physical sickness, Faye, is the same thing. It's not affecting me. I'm not sick. My body is sick or my body's and, and sickness is not designed to be terminal and for a lifetime. It's temporary and we treat it like it becomes our best friend, but it's temporary. The same thing in a car wreck, Faye. Uh, as I said, if something happens to me, it's not me. It's my body. And you know, unfortunately, things happen and people say, well, God's hand of protection wasn't on you or you goofed up and you caused the, you know, you know, I don't I don't even want to talk about that because I just don't see it that way. So, you know, it's it's a real it's a real big issue with people. I made a quick little drawing. It's not good or anything, but it, it kind of shows what we're talking about here. When we were with God, we were totally spirit. If you can see that very good, but we were totally spirit. And then when we were born, the body came in and then we were totally body and spirit. And when we were born, we also was given a soul. Now that soul does not have the spirit in it until we learn about God. When we learn about God, that soul becomes 
full of the spirit, but sometimes it takes longer. Sometimes it takes time to learn, for instance, just how much Father God loves you. Some people think they've done things so bad that nobody could love them, especially Father God. Mm -hmm. How can he love me with what I've done? Well, that means your soul is not full of his spirit. It means your soul is full of condemnation or all these other things that you've learned from religion but it's not full of god's true spirit so once you get that soul full of god's true spirit it begins to get smaller and smaller or else the spirit just takes over that soul and we believe that once the spirit takes complete charge of that whole soul soul and we don't question the things of God, but we just know that what he says is truth, then that's when we can actually interact with that other realm. Do you agree with that, Dr. Bill? Well, you've said a lot there. And, um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. and, and, you know, it, it, every time you say a bunch of stuff, I, it gives me a lot of different things to address. I know we don't have time for that, but yeah, we are a spirit. Think of Adam and Eve, for example. The Bible says in Genesis chapter three and the eyes at verse seven, the eyes of their understanding were enlightened and they knew what is it that they didn't know before and why didn't they know it? Because all they did as spirit beings was enjoy God, but they had no natural awareness until they sin and they have, now they have a consciousness. So it doesn't take sin in our, our, uh, our, our time frame. It's not sin that awakens your conscious. It's, the spirit of God that awakens your conscience. And so you have a knowing of God, uh, even even early on as a, as a child, you have a knowing of God, uh, even if you're not taught about God. And then comes things that we err because we don't know God, so we sin. Um, so, uh, you know, there's a lot of truth there. And then we are housed in a physical body like a spacesuit, so we can function in this natural earthly realm. But the reality is this that God is in us. He loves us. He cares about us. He just want, invites us to love him back. But you say something sometimes, and I want you to repeat that about Adam, that God was not the one that told him he did wrong. No, when Adam sinned, uh, they hid, the Bible says they hid among the trees of the garden. Um, and, and God comes along and he says, Adam, where are you? And Adam says, I, I, uh, we hid ourselves among the trees of the garden because we sinned. And God said th this question to him, who told you? Who told you that? So in other words, what God was saying is, is I'm not the one that kicked you out or I'm not the one that told you. And I'm going to pull that up, Faye, because the, you're making a very interesting point here. Um, and so Adam says, uh, uh, I heard your voice in the garden. I was afraid because I was naked and hid myself. But Adam had been used to hearing God's voice in the garden. Right. They would walk together. God would come and visit him. He had visitations where we have habitations. But he would come and visit him in the cool of the day. And Adam said, I heard your voice in the garden. And what I did is I ran and, and hid because now my perspective of God changed because I sinned. And God immediately says, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree which I commanded you that you should not eat of? <coughs> of course, now because of sin and our perception, Adam says, the woman you gave me, she did it. And the woman says the the serpent did it and, and, and so on and so forth. So you're right. Adam's perspective changed about God. Now we come into this earth born in this this age and what happens they is our perspective is oftentimes of the works of the flesh what's the thing that adam and eve did partook of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil a type of the arm of the flesh so we're born and even though we're christians and our parents were christians they here's the thing they were and i, I don't mean any offense by this but they were predominantly fleshly Christians. What I mean by that, and same with us, we, we came into this as fleshly Christians. What it means is, is we pretty much pay attention to what the flesh says, and that becomes our perspective of God. God cannot be interpreted by our fleshly feelings or emotions. God must be interpreted by truth. And that's why I say what I know must always be greater than what I feel. 
Amen. Amen. Well, this last one is uh, what's going on in the world today. The last few days we've heard about groups of people wanting to start up what they call a civil war, which they uh, intend to carry all over the United States simply because they are against President Trump. And then we have also heard about the small church in Texas yesterday. Uh, the church only run about 50 people and a gunman came in and shot at least 27 of them. Right. What do people do? to stop the fear from gripping their heart every time they go out, even to church. There's so many shootings that go on in different places. How can they have that protection to feel comfortable to go out to church and not feel like they've got to carry a gun or they've got to do something extra to, to even get out of their house? Well, Faye, my answer is not going to be a, a really a, 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 a acceptable answer but you said what can they do about not being afraid uh, my answer is stop being afraid <laughs> i mean i mean what is the worst thing that can happen uh it's not that as i said earlier someone could chop my head off or shoot me uh, it's the worst thing that can happen is you if you're operating in your flesh watching someone chop my head off or shoot me okay but if someone chops my head off or shoots me and i die what is the worst thing that happens nothing. There is no worse. I am in that great cloud of witnesses. And I got news for people, like it or not, call me a fanatic, call me a lunatic, call me a false prophet. You can kill me, but I will be back. Because okay. most of the people that are so scared that want to carry guns or want to do this. I mean, there's yeah. a lot of different things out there. Most of them only believe you're going to live about 70 or 80 or 90 years anyway. You know, right. they don't believe in living like we believe that we can live long, long, long lives or forever, you know? So people do not carry guns because they're, uh, because of they want to protect themselves. People carry guns because they're afraid. Right. Well, and because they want to protect other people, too. I think, you know, some of them have it in them. I mean, thank God for the policeman that got there that uh, protected the rest of the people that was in that church or that gunman could have maybe shot all of them. You know, so we need authorities that are not afraid to get out there and to take of care of people that are doing wrong. Um, and I think guns are necessary in yeah. the hands of the right people or for hunting, for food, or things of that nature. Maybe even they're, they're necessary if you live in the country and there's coyotes or wolves or things like that, and you have to protect your family. I get all of that. But, you know, quite honestly, Faye, uh, what happens when the threat of a tornado is coming to where we live? What yeah, happens? I don't take care of that, will it? I, I, I go outside, don't I? <laughs> yeah. You go outside I know I, to it. Yeah, I, I go outside and I point my finger at it and I command it. Now, I don't have to go outside and point my finger at it to command it, but I just do that a lot. So the reality is, is if I get in fear, I believe there's a great possibility that that storm could come and hit uh, where we live. Now, here's another question, Faye, because you, when you bring up about protection, did God allow that tornado to hit us because I got in fear? God didn't tell me to get in fear. It wasn't God's fault. And I'm not even going to say that the tornado got us because we got afraid. Here's what I say is there are natural, they're called natural disasters. I will never agree with an insurance company and, and say that it's an act of God. Right. I know a minister whose roof got blown off. And they had the roof repaired and for the insurance to pay, he had to sign a paper saying uh, the claim paper saying that it was an act of God. And he argued with them and told them, based on what I believe, this is not an act of God. They ended up scratching out the words act of God. And, you know, that's just a technicality for me. I, I don't know if it's a big I, I am not going to blame God, but there are natural disasters, Faye, the atmosphere, the hot and cold weather that comes together, that causes tornadoes, causes hurricanes. It, it, there are just stuff that happens. But the but truth what about is, praying it's not that does go back up into the atmosphere, like you said. Is that possible? Well, is Faye. That I, I can't tell you that everything we prayed for has happened, but what I can tell you is everything in our area 
that we prayed about when it comes to disastrous storms has happened. Every time we spoke to a tornado, the tornado has obeyed us. Uh, we've lived here for 20, uh, 22 years, I think, and no tornado has hit Rolla. If, if I remember right, the whole time. I know we've lived other places when we used to live in fear and didn't understand. Uh, but but since we've lived here, we've come and I and I don't care if a tornado comes tomorrow and touches the outskirts of Rolla or hits someone. We have commanded tornadoes and they did not touch down. What I'm saying is if that changed tomorrow, it wouldn't change what we believe. I, I believe no tornado will touch down here. Now, if we know about it in advance. Maybe why we you you ask a question, Payne. I, I I hate to bring this up live, but you ask a question about the recent hurricanes in in uh, uh, Florida and the Virgin Islands and um, yes. and all of those areas down there. Why praying didn't stop them? Here's a possibility that those storms were already engaged and about to hit before you ever knew about any of it. Um, you know, I know there are times that there's threats and we get on those threats and we put a stop to it in faith. But here's what I wonder. What if in those areas there were tons of people, tons of people who were in fear and were not. And so, you know, are we called to to police the whole world? I don't think so. I think we're called to be a part of a remnant who pleases the whole world. So. I don't think I can get the gospel preached to the world by myself. I don't think you can get the gospel preached through your magazine by yourself, although you do it quite a bit by yourself, other than the articles I edit and things like that. The truth is no, that God didn't intend any of us to do even our ministries by ourselves. And so, you know, we're going to be going online tomorrow, Faye, and we're going to be talking about this afternoon also. But we're going to go online for three hours tomorrow evening and and trying to raise funds for World Bible School University. But, you know, Faye, you and I have our own ministry. That's what we're doing right now is our own ministry. And we have since since I've been teaching some things, we've lost some supporters. I think we're down to one and maybe still two supporters. And we're doing our ministry based on that. You know, the truth is we're trusting God. It would be easier if we had, you know, a, a dozen or, or 20 or 30 supporters, even with a little bit of money to Bill Henshaw Ministries. That'd be wonderful. That's not where we are right now. But we're going to continue to preach the gospel. And in time, God will bring others into our, our fold where we will have the help we need. Amen. That's very true. And um I'm not sure if uh, anybody um, is watching from the YouTube, but I did want to mention again, um, I will be sharing this show on Facebook so people can see it. But I did want to mention again that Tuesday night that Dr. Bill talked about from 5 to 8 p.m., we will have what's called a webathon and we'll be raising money for the Christian uh, University, uh, World Bible School University for a building. And that's mm -hmm. what we need to get started is a building there. We have seen one here in town uh, that we liked and it sold. We found another one we like. But if we take it or if we if we, you know, build our own, it doesn't matter. Whatever money we have come in that will meet that need. That's mm -hmm. what we want. So if you can join us, Cynthia Rothrup mm -hmm. will be joining us. She's a world uh, martial artist, uh, movie star, and she has agreed to come on the webathon with us tomorrow night. So just share and let your friends know and make sure you come on at from five to eight. And sometime during that time, she will be on with us. Mm -hmm. um, so this is, uh, did you have anything else to say, Dr. Bill, about what we talked about, any of the questions today or anything? No, I would just say that, uh, that since we're going to be coming on this afternoon. Uh, I want to tell everybody World Bible School International Training Center already exists in terms of, of a corporation. Uh, and I, I can't I don't have time to, to grab the paper here, Faye. Uh, maybe I maybe I do. Um, here we go. Uh, World Bible School International Training Center is a legal entity. OK, we already own that. Uh, we own World Bible School University. But the problem is, is that we have 
inter, inter, internet, uh, worldwide accreditation. We have curriculum. The problem is we don't have a building. Now, uh, God put it on our heart to establish a university, uh, which we will have a worship center in it. But but God has put it on our heart to do it different. We're going to instead of build a church with a university in it, we're going to have a university with a church in it, so to speak. It'll be a worship, Sunday worship. Now, I want to say this, that we already have that. But what we don't have is a building right here in Rolla. We've looked at a few buildings. We can build a building. We saw a building yesterday we talked about. We can build. And it looked really nice. So my, my point is this. It's going to take a lot of money for a building unless somebody walks up and knocks on our door and says, here's the deed to a piece of property. It's got a building on it. Uh, we need we're not talking about a single building, although we would start there. We're talking about a campus, a university campus in America. That's a big deal. Someone asked me, Faye said, don't do you have to have a building to start a Bible college in America? Yes, you do. OK, however it is in your country, it's not that way here. You have to have a building. So we're looking for a campus or a place we can develop into a campus. So that is the only thing that's hindering us at this moment from moving forward with this project. Once we have that building, Faye, as you know, and I know, and I don't I don't like this part, but it will take us some time to get it put together, get the, the, the furnishings and get everything set up so we can start taking student applications. So, um, you know, and I as far as the questions today, great questions. I'm sure possibly not the answers everybody wants, but but great questions. I think the biblical answers were good. Uh, so thank you for having me on the show today. And thank you for your answers. I know I didn't give you uh, pre-notice with these questions. You just yeah. found out this morning what they were. Yeah. And so uh, I appreciate Dr. Bill that ever since I've known him, he's been a studier of the word. He doesn't take what other people say, but he's one of those that go out on the cutting edge and, and whether people like it or not, he tells truth. So I appreciate that. I appreciate you being on our show today and we'll see you at two o'clock this afternoon on campus chat with Dr. Bill and Faye and God bless you. And thank you for joining us today. Um, I'll share the webinar just as soon as it is uploaded so you can share it to your family and friends and we will see you again next week and God bless you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye everyone.